this year I think this is an important lecture because um, Marcelin actually wrote an essay for the um, thesis book where she collected a lot of uh, thoughts, uh, ideas, and, and similar qualities among the different projects in the book. Um, meaning from 2006 to 2013, she tried to find uh, the trajectories that the school has been developing in the past seven years of work. So I think this is a, maybe uh, one of the most important lectures we had this year because it's the first one that analytically goes through them. So I'm glad she agreed to do this. And I wish everybody would be here. You're not 100 and you should be here. Next week, we have Todd Gannon lecturing. Um, so same time, one to two. Um, we'll have also a third lecture by Andrew Zago, um, the 17th of February. And we still have two meetings with Jeff. So we still have a few um, collective um, events that you should all participate to because I think they really shape um, and contribute to your thesis. Marcelin. Thank you, Elena. Um, and I was informed that we are going to be having periodic uh, fire alarm tests. <laughs> we don't have to leave the building. They're just going to be sounding the alarm. So don't be surprised if that happens during the talk. Um, so this lecture actually began, as Elena said, uh, with the kind of uh, somewhat overwhelming task of trying to comprehend uh, 47 thesis projects that had taken place here. Uh, there, I mean, there are hundreds that had taken place between 2006 um, and 2013. But of the 47 that are presented in the book, uh, I was, it was sort of a staggering task to think about how to begin to talk about them um, or how to begin to read them. And of course, some of them I, I know more intimately than others. Some of them I'd been on the uh, review discussions, so I knew the author's intent. Um, and many I had just seen uh, presented in the hallways. So I thought it would be an interesting exercise to kind of create a lens through which to read them as if I didn't know them at all. Um, and so the, the title of the talk is called Minutia. Minutia being the really small, minute things that actually uh, differentiate one thing from another. Um, I'm a firm believer that any good thesis really deals uh, in the realm of what to other people, <laughs> to normal humans, might seem to be minutia, but to the author of that thesis is something that becomes uh, kind of central to the worldview that he or she is, is building up in the project. So I'm just going to start by reading a little bit of the text. I'll be going back and forth between reading and, and uh, talking extemporaneously. Um, I'd like to begin with a quote by Jorge Luis Borges, uh, one of my favorite authors. Some of you have heard this quote uh, in the Vertical Lottery, um, and here it is. He was, let us not forget, almost incapable of ideas of a general platonic sort. Not only was it difficult for him to comprehend that the ge generic symbol dog embraces so many unlike individuals of diverse size and form, it bothered him that the dog at 314 seen from the side should have the same name as the dog at 315 seen from the front. I suspect, however, that he was not very capable of thought. To think is to forget differences, generalize, make abstractions. In the teeming world of Funus, there were only details, almost immediate in their presence. The 45 thesis project books, uh, projects compiled in, in the forthcoming book uh, and compiled here in the lecture reflect to some extent a paradox inherent to the discipline of architecture. Architecture as a practice necessitates acts of translation. The material actualization of virtual sets of instructions in the form of drawings or codes is fundamental to its production. The shift from one medium to another, from that of the drawing to the model, for example, or from drawing to building, involves varying degrees of specificity. The exclusion of certain kinds of information deemed inappropriate at a particular scale and the inclusion of other kinds of information within a given medium is driven by the conventions of architectural notation. Thus, the architect must employ a degree of generalization in the interest of enhancing or affording legibility to a larger audience. 
In order to be recognized as a contribution to a shared body of knowledge, the architectural project must be capable of being compared to other similar projects with the aim of understanding how that project is in fact different from the others and why that difference may constitute something of significance. So when we ask why is your project relevant uh, to the discipline, really touching on that. Um, it's not asking for sheer novelty, but it's asking for you to understand your work in the context of other projects that have preceded it or that are currently going on even in the school right here amongst your peers. Um, and also being able to recognize where your works differ from one another. This act of recognition entails the eradication of difference in order to establish similitude before more precise categorical differences can be identified. Gregory Bateson's characterization of information as, quote, the difference that makes a difference, end of quote, is relevant to this discussion. What's the difference, we might ask, between all of these unlike projects, like the dog, seen from the side, of diverse size and form that nonetheless are all included in the category thesis? Or conversely, what does the difference that makes a difference, when does the difference that makes a difference make something in fact too different to be compared with the others? This is where the concept of minutia may be of some use. In the text Funus the Memorius by Jorge Luis Borges, the text is essentially the story of a mind that draws and redraws ceaselessly the contours of every object and every space that it imagines. Each encounter is recorded in full detail. In delineating the difficulty this poses to acts of translation between images and words, Borges tells us the following. Locke, in the 17th century, postulated and rejected an impossible language in which each individual thing, each stone, each bird, and each branch would have its own name. Funes once projected an analogous language, but discarded it because it seemed too general to him, too ambiguous. In fact, Funes remembered not only every leaf of every tree, of every wood, but also every one of the times he had perceived or imagined it. Toward the east, along a stretch not yet divided into blocks, there were new houses unknown to Funus. He imagined them to be black, compact, made of homogeneous darkness. In that direction, he would turn his face in order to sleep. So the mind of Funus, the incessant builder, relies on the eradication of detail in order to pause and to attain a state of repose. Hence, homogeneous darkness is the preferred building material capable of halting the ceaseless act of drawing. Black, compact, homogeneous darkness all provide a means of generalizing, essentially overwriting what may be considered trifling details or minutia, overwriting that with a black spot or a macula in perception. The projects, on, the projects that you're about to see and the pre presented on the pages of the book do exactly the opposite. They populate the imagination with form, line work, contour, and color. They accentuate minutia and seemingly insignificant details, thereby proposing myriad ways of imagining and inhabiting the world. This body of work traffics in forms of specificity taken beyond a point where detail is merely sufficient. Instead, it defines what may be, in fact, a possible world that imagines, uh, emerges from that detail. The state of homogeneous darkness in Borges' story results in the omission of detail, yet the presence of detail or distinguishing features is what guarantees that we can establish some sort of criteria for comparison or similitude. Even a cursory examination of the projects presented here, the sci thesis projects, tells us that they depart in significant ways from what we may consider to be familiar or commonplace forms of architecture. When it comes to the more rigorous task of defining how we might think about these projects within specific architectural lineages and articulate their differences or how we might attach adjectives to the things presented here in order to more accu accurately describe them, one needs to select a point of departure. The line is one place to begin. We can enumerate different kinds of lines, frayed lines, scribbled lines, smooth lines, straight lines, invisible lines. And we can observe that the accrual of lines produces diverse entities, tangle, fuzz, 
labyrinth, laminae, convolution, stack. The fuzzy lines that appear in the project's vector paradise, here by Emily White, Vulnerable Lines by Jin Se Yoon, uh, What Up by Johannes Beck, uh, Superposition, Sarah Blankenbaker. Some of our faculty know these quite well, and I, I know I'm doing a misreading probably. <laughs> and Andrew and Elena and all the faculty have taught these students can correct. Um, these, these projects share particular qualities that can in turn be compared with the frayed edges of the cosmetic limit, phantom geometry by Liz and Kyle von Hessel, uh, low fidelity, Aaron Besler, his right red hand, oh, sorry, we're still in Aaron's, and his right red hand, Benjamin Farnsworth. So again, this, the shift, I mean, interesting to me was to begin to kind of create a lens of scrutiny. Um, in particular, it seems like a rather obvious one, but to begin to take apart very specific views of these projects. I mean, I'd seen large drawings printed out and presented on the walls, um, moving into the digital files and almost zooming in to discrete details uh, to begin to compare these projects according to the role of, of the line in the work. That's also his right red hand. The scribbled line work in adjunct devices of perception, deep relief, and contemporary vernacular differentiates itself uh, quite clearly from the laminar qualities of the lines that appear, uh, sorry, this is still um, in exuberant, liminal form and calligraphical aesthetics, vulnerable lines, exquisite heartbreak hotel, a home within a home, dirty privileged matter, and DOA, or drawing unrestraint. The projects Naked and Cartooning Disbelief, uh, Marie Sophie Starlinger and Joseph Ramiro, possess aqueous qualities, whereas the slashes of fuzzy figures, pictorial dissolution of formal perception, and the bastardized gestalt exhibit a shared predilection for sharpness with the serrated edges of mediated disconcertion and phantom geometry. The controlled sinuousness of XOXO, Working Blue, one of my favorite titles for a thesis. <laughs> Um, it fill us right, distinguishes itself from the clearly delineated edges in the cut, unlikely things in a likely world, familiar primitives, many friendly dinosaurs, and fields so good. Again, different kinds of cuts, graphic cuts, three-dimensional cuts, and uh, cuts through a mass. The flipping and mirroring of folded city, convention center, and strange symmetry, the conjoined twin, produces compromising juxtapositions that can be contrasted with those engendered through the stacks of home improvement. Rendezvous, recent histories, and the manifold spaces that are found in the labyrinth and the sectional object. Four D, the bastardized gestalt, 
Grand Central Canyon, mechanical systems, office building, Stefano Passeri, and inside in, Sophie L'Oreal. So you can see we've got a lot of the uh, convoluted spaces category going on. Um, in Meat Locker, a narrative of irreconcilable figures, the line is an invisible trajectory of motion that animates the figures that comprise the project. It was a stop frame animation. In the project's material behavior and innerscapes, one discovers lines that are accumulations of particulate matter and possess qualities that elude, elude an attempt to define linearity. We also find pixelated lines, lines that erase themselves through accumulation. Paperweight, by David Eskenazi, traffics in exchanges that occur between different types of lines when subjected to scrutiny moving from the fluid contours that characterize its massing to the seemingly incompatible objects that populate its interior, uh, like the head of uh, Phillips head screws that we see here inside of the plan. Upon closer scrutiny, we may find that these provisional affiliations are in fact somewhat ludicrous. Within the generic category of fuzzy lines, we find things as varied as the coupling of an absent object and the proliferation of images that are engendered by it, as in the fuzzy avatars of the photographed Barrett and Hillebescher towers uh, that are the subject of superposition. That contrasted with a set of curves that reveal how they inhabit a surface and simultaneously become decoupled from it in vulnerable lines. And finally, lines that actually have different instantiations depending upon one's orientation, as in the project Vector Paradise. Again, I think Devin can tell me if that's a misreading of the, um, you know, the amazing order from one viewpoint and the tangle, the three-dimensionality seen in an orthographic view. These lines are fundamentally <clears throat> different in behavior from one another and belong to quite different genres of contemporary architecture. The designation of frayed lines begins to fray itself when we consider that the frayed axonometrics of low fidelity, driven by intrinsic rule sets of iteration, so the iterations of House 6 robotically uh, drawn with the marker, um, that they belong to an entirely different procedural logic than the extrinsic character of the appliques that are performed in the cosmetic limit, which are really dealing with the exterior of the architecture and really um, a kind of enveloping situation, a cladding, a cosmetic that starts to become deep, very different but within the category of frayed lines nonetheless. The scribbly laser cut lines that comprise the drawings of contemporary vernacular could plausibly be congruent to a section of the cut figures in many friendly dinosaurs. So understanding that as a plausible section. Although the former drawing relies on subtractive logics of inscription through cutting while the latter model incorporates an additive process of massing. The laminar quality of the contour lines in a home within a home and DOA, or drawing unrestraint, can be delaminated into two divergent trajectories. The first project situates the line in respect to the surface from which it is extracted, while the second is emphatic about the detachment of the line from the surface. So in one, we see the line as an appendage, um, a kind of a foreign agent in the existing building. Um, in the other, completely liberated, the line completely liberated from surface to the extent that there was a, um, the series of drawings and then the three-dimensional model of the, the black surface onto which these lines could again be projected. So a very different 
positioning of the role of the line um, as a tool in the project. Uh, let's see. Where are we? The slashes that are evident in fuzzy figures, pictorial dissolution of formal perception, and the bastardized gestalt produce, in the first instance, a flickering that enhances the definition of the envelope as a thickened entity, and in the second, an oscillation that permeates deep into the building's interior. So in one case, really working on uh, a sort of dematerialization of the massiveness of the, of the form, again, extrinsic versus intrinsic, um, where literally the organization of the interior is, is radically altered due to the slashing. The serrated edges of mediated disconcertion produce an inscrutability of the underlying surfaces of the building of La Brousse Library, whereas those in phantom geometry construct the surface itself. So in one case, we have an additive procedure which really builds a completely uh, a sort of semi-autonomous entity um, or form. In the other, a growth, again, a process of accretion that starts to undermine its, its host. Um, in the category of sinuous lines, we encounter seemingly incidental but very different treatment of lines. Those that, when thickened, maintain a specified turning radius in XO, XO. Whereas in working blue, the thickening and bending affords the emergence of unsettling creases. So again, the treatment of a certain uh, degree of control of curvature and treatment of these edges that when you scrutinize, you'll see different uh, conditions that occur depending upon the curvature that's used, as opposed to a different kind of attitude where material is more resistant to curvature and starts to um, generate anomalies within the form. The cut and familiar, the cut, this one, and familiar primitives, both work with techniques of incision to produce delineated edges. The former project produces a series of planar incisions that provocatively interrupt non-planar objects much in the way of a tomographic section. In the latter project, the logic of the cut is coincident with the surface logic, resulting in a coherence between contour and object. So again, thinking to something like the uh, multiplicitous and inorganic bodies of Greg Lynn, the text about the cut being used either as a, a tool for projection by the architect or a tool for analysis by the, uh, the doctor in terms of the the tomographic cut and the sort of form of the body which is being cut uh, differing from the logic of the cut. The logics of transposition that drive the folded city and strange symmetry, the conjoined twin, operate on completely different scales, yielding in the first instance an urban field comprised of numerous constituents that confront one another about the axis of the hinge. And in the second, an inherently dualistic yet monolithic object. The collocations that comprise home improvement and recent histories produce distinct part to whole relationships in the two projects. Home improvement occludes interior definition to focus on the figural outline of each unit in the stack, whereas recent histories accentuates interior definition to produce anomalies within the larger amalgam. The labyrinthine spaces engendered by the project's uh, 4D, the bastardized gestalt, and the labyrinth and the sectional object engage repetition in utterly different ways. Acts of multiplication are performed in these projects according to quite different logics. The bastardized gestalt involves the vivisection and interlacing of multiple entities, really dealing with a kind of um, fictional history or sort of fictional archaeology in the sense of an historical building uh, that now no longer is the projection of a new building, contemporary history, 
uh, being slashed. Um, the labyrinth and the sectional object exhibits a nearly algorithmic procedure in its stacking of spaces. So the stacking one thing after another with one thing after another uh, transforming throughout the stack. And 4D translates singular entities into manifold images. So again, different forms of labyrinthine space, uh, one dealing very much with um, image projection and one dealing with geometry, but nonetheless both creating a kind of labyrinth. Of course, the line has no dimension without the specific medium in which it is delineated. The medium, in the sense that I use it here, includes not only the physical aspects of a project's instantiation, but more importantly, the disciplinary lineage within, each, with, within which each project positions itself. The discourses engaged by each project and the audiences to which it is addressed become specific mediums in which the project resides. The line is not only the trace of a point in motion, and had the selected point of departure for our discussion been stipulated as color, for instance, differences could be established between those projects where the selection of black and white acts as a rhetorical device. That it really speaks to uh, the fundamental sort of stance of the project. It, it, it must be in black and white in order for the project to function in the way it does versus those that assume a grayscale palette as an overt avoidance of color. Versus those that embrace color as an effusive material property. In that case, the affiliations between these projects would be quite different. So it is ultimately in the minutia, the small and trifling matters that differentiate one project from another, that we find their indelible identities. Undoubtedly, Borges' character Funis would have, delight, would have delighted in surveying uh, the Sciarc thesis projects, and especially the ones that are about to come this year. Um, perhaps his proposal of an analogous language for each would be necessary in order to adequately describe the richness of Sciarc thesis. So that is the, yeah, the main part of this uh, lecture that Elena asked me to do. Um, the second part was to a really formidable task of to try to identify um, current or uh, directions forward um, for uh, the coming thesis class. Um, anyone who's taken my CS class theories of contemporary architecture one knows that I often use this uh, taxonomy that is found in, in the text called The Analytical Language of John Wilkins, also by Jorge Luis Borges. I thought I would start and end with Borges. It's a nice symmetry there. Um, where he talks about the fabled Chinese encyclopedia that's called the Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge. Um, in that encyclopedia, every creature in the universe is divided into these categories. Uh, what is amazing is that as you start to read the categories, obviously there are things that begin to include one another, uh, including in H, included in the present classification, um, belonging to the emperor, embalmed, tame, suckling pigs, sirens, fabulous, stray dogs, included in the present classification, frenzied, innumerable, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc., having just broken the water pitcher, and that from a long way off look like flies. So if you are a, um, a fabulous stray dog that happens to look like a fly from a long way off, you're going to be in three of the categories. Um, we use this in the class as a, a kind of way of thinking about the provisional role of how we delineate, you know, something that, that Jeff, I mean, recently there have been discussions about the shift from, from genre to tendency. Uh, Jeff and Peter have talked about that in a recent issue of Log, and there's a class right now that some of you, I think, might be enrolled in. Um, 
rebooting genre, I think it's called. Uh, but really starting to think about, you know, why it, why it would be even relevant to try to act, to try to name or differentiate between different approaches uh, to architecture and where those categories begin to fall down or where they begin to really um, hold water. And so in a sense, the beauty of this taxonomy is also that, that the words he's shifting uh, between things that are nouns and adjectives and adverbs, um, phrases, so that even the kind of uh, structure of the language starts to fall apart. We're not comparing, comparing nouns to nouns, um, but we're comparing nouns to adjectives. And they start to kind of become embroiled in one another. Um, this is something pointed out by Michel Foucault quite beautifully in the preface to the order of things, uh, if you're interested in exploring that further. So just, I had a little fun with it. I said SciArc thesis projects are divided into close reading and the role of the inscrutable. So what it means, to, it's something we started to discuss in a few projects last year at the, at the final reviews. What is the difference between a project that requires a close reading versus a project that requires scrutiny in order to understand its premise or its underlying structure? And I think there can be a big difference between that. The close reading obviously um, you know, can be a formal reading that is imposed upon the project by someone who's not familiar with the uh, intention of the author. The inscrutable part being something that uh, really necessitates, I wouldn't say, it, in some cases it may necessitate a close reading, but in some cases it may just necessitate that you actually get close to the work, spend time with it, and start to see things inside of it. I mean, much like I did when I put together this lecture, it was kind of fantastic to have access to these drawings that you know had been hanging on the wall in 2006 and to zoom in and see really to be able to revisit some of uh, of that drawing on a very close scale but again you know as uh, as Graham Harmon has pointed out in, in a recent text uh, on, on Sherry Turkle's book um, evocative objects the act of translation he's talking about the, the digital archive of, of Corbusier and how somebody is um, examining one of the drawings and lamenting the fact that they no longer have the original, but that the digital brings in a whole other set of, of qualities while it removes certain qualities. And so Harmon is talking about the, the issue of caricature and so that when you translate a thing from one medium to another, um, there are sort of fundamental features that are maintained and certain things that are lost. Um, so that that's sort of what that first uh, category is about. Um, misreading, obviously the productive misreading of that which has, has come before or that which is currently uh, ongoing in the, in the peer group of projects. Um, the same kind of misreading that I probably just performed on a lot of these thesis projects. It'll be fun to talk to some of the uh, people who taught the students after. Um, provisional, the idea of the you know, provisional utopia, I think, was brought up several years ago in a, a book by Stan Allen. Uh, the idea that we may agree, we may convene on a certain point at a certain moment in time um, in terms of our discourse, uh, but that those kind of character characterizations or classifications can sometimes be provisional, sometimes fleeting. Uh, and sometimes have a longer duration. So to think about the, the sort of duration of the, of the argument in the thesis. Character, um, this is something you should talk to Todd about. I think Todd brought this up on a recent 2GAX review in the fall, and we had a great discussion about it uh, in terms of the need to, or, or the desire perhaps to reintroduce the aspect of, of character that may be a character, as in, you know, creating a character within the work, or imbuing the work with a certain kind of character can be understood in two senses. Um, the analogous digital, again, you know, within the sort of uh, digital mode that we work uh, within, how can we start to? create a reflection on that, a sort of critical reflection using those tools but also stepping outside of them and in some way possibly subverting them to reveal some of their, uh, their tendencies or things we might take for granted and how we might begin to unpack that. I, th I think in David Eskenazi's project last year he was, he was addressing um, some of those issues. 
related to scale versus size. Fabulous, because we always need to have a few fabulous thesis projects. Um, speculative or real. Speculative realism is a big discussion right now with the um, object-oriented ontology. Uh, discussions about the role of objects and their um, kind of autonomy from us and decentering the kind of uh, human-centric view of how we relate to objects. H is included in the convention. Some of you may be really taking on architectural convention and uh, applying it to things uh, for which it was not designed in order to reveal um, certain limitations of that particular convention. Where does it begin to break down or where does it begin to um, create productive anomalies? That leads us to the anomaly. Big fan of that one. Um, minutia, again, the very tiny, discrete thing. How you uh, make two lines, make a corner, for instance, can become a fundamental aspect of a project. As to how, I think Andrew, I'm not sure if we'll talk about in the lecture last year, gave a beautiful lecture about uh, the corner problem in Mises work versus the array of Zaha Hadid projects, and I, I, I'm not sure if you'll be, but that was a great lecture. Um, drawn with a very fine robotic camel hairbrush. That one's very, that one's for Devin. <laughs> addendum um, is, you know, the addendum, placing your addendum on the particular argument, really looking at, I think it's important to, within your thesis groups and your groups of colleagues in studio, you know, talk about really what you saw last year, what you saw, I mean, this book, I don't know when it'll, will it come out during the summer? Yes. Great. So, I mean, I think it's really important to look at the projects and to read them through your own lens. I mean, I took a really arbitrary take on that in terms of like, let's just think about lines. Um, but there are many other ways you could start to think about really what the argument behind the project was in a larger sense. Um, you could think about its role in terms of a, a kind of cultural role that the project has. Um, so there are many, many myriad ways of beginning to do that. Um, M is having just broken the rule. If you break the rule in a really precise way, you can uh, actually do some really amazing things. Not just breaking the rule for the sake of it, but with intention. And finally, those projects that from a long way off look like buildings. <laughs> so with that, I think that about wraps up this talk. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Because oh, you're sure. the only one that really answered a lot of the questions we had in thesis. I think this lecture was quite important. Thank you. Um, also, was a kind of nice thing to see everybody's project together. I, I know you have no idea, but Nicole maybe is the only person that understands how many projects we went through. I think hundreds and hundreds of projects, and we chose those. And um, hoping that both Todd and Zago, who will lecture next week, uh, will address some of the issues of the book and their essays that are supposedly in the book. <laughs> and you don't make me go <laughs> to next year. I don't want to add another year to this book. Um, it was, it, it's a nice luxury to see everybody's project together, actually, and re-edited and re-seen by someone else. This was to hopefully give you a sense of what has been done before you, and clearly there is a lot of editing from my end, and Marcelin's end is not in any way a catalog of what thesis has been. There is much more than this, many more voices, um, more, many more aesthetic, honestly, as well. Um, but somehow you have to edit down to what you think is the most uh, provocative, important, groundbreaking uh, work. And also, there is something about distance when you look at projects that have been there for seven years. Some hold the time and some don't. And um, it's a big lesson to, to architects in general, what representational tools do and what meaning theses hold after a certain amount of time. And where these minutiae are actually building upon bigger issues than probably uh, the project stays for a longer time. So I hope it was useful. Do you guys have questions about this?
faculty? No questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.